In today's episode, we talk about the 10 types of people who fail at fitness. For example, are you a chronic dieter? Are you a group exerciser? The forever bulker. There's 10 of them. Maybe you're one of them. So I know you're going to enjoy this episode. Also, later on, we're going to give away a free MAPS workout program bundle. So stay tuned. Here comes the show. All right, check this out. Uh, we've been training people for a long time, and we can pretty much neatly categorize people into 10 categories of individuals who tend to fail at fitness. Chances are, if you have a tough time staying consistent, you probably fit into one of the categories. You're one of these people. It's so today. arrogant of us. I know. Yeah. <laughs> We're, we're going to put you in a box right now. Yeah. <laughs> no, the truth is, Generalize obviously, you. most people don't fit neatly in one of these, but it's and there's a lot of crossover. But, you know, having managed so many gyms and working with so many people, you tend to see trends, constant trends, yeah. especially when it comes to people who tend to struggle with being consistent with exercise and nutrition, people who tend to do the yo-yo dieting, people who tend to just have a challenges with this. And so I think an episode like this can be valuable because we'll be able to kind of narrow it down a little bit and talk to people about, hey, this if, if this is you, this is what you could do to help yourself out. And you're not alone, by the way. This is a lot of people fit into the these categories. No, I, I mean, I, I, I'm teasing, but I, I do think that everybody has a little bit of some of this in them, right? Yeah, there's there's a lot of common themes that we've seen. Yeah, you're through. lying. You're lying yeah. if you don't. I yeah. mean, I, I think at one point I've I've had at least I was at least three or four of these characters. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So I think that everybody can relate one way or another, whether you've moved on from that character or not. But at one point you realize I mean, this was a, a, a DM I received last week when I was uh, in Hawaii and I thought it was a really, uh, another trainer I think sent it over and said, hey, this would be an, an interesting conversation to hear you guys have and I sent it over to Sal and Sal was like, oh yeah, that's, I do think that's really good and when you wrote up the most common ones, I was just like, oh yeah, that's those are spot on. I feel like- It's I, interesting, right? I, I can visually remember like I have a, a, a person exactly. that I I could totally go, oh, that person was that. You know, it's funny. After it's, it's after about 10 years, you start to see patterns, a lot of patterns. And um, people will come in. You'll ask them their goals. You talk about their fitness history. Then you start training them. And then you see these patterns develop. You go, okay, you, you're like these other five people I've worked with before. And, uh, you know, after you work with people for a long time, you start to kind of figure out how to communicate to different personalities and what works for them. And that's really what this is going to be all about is, you know, if you fall into one of these categories or, or multiple categories, we're going to talk a little bit about strategies that'll be successful for you. So let's start with the first one. And this one's pretty common. This is the chronic dieter. So this person has been on a lot of fat diets. They've at one point done keto. They've gone vegan. They have paleo. They've done intermittent fasting. Every time a new diet comes out, Mm -hmm. they're the first ones on it. And they're always, of course, the, they stop after a couple months because it doesn't work for them. Waiting for the next fad to come along, waiting for the next book or the next way that they heard somebody lose weight for them to, you know, to, to jump on board. Yeah. And sometimes you'll see like, and they're very much of an evangelist because the last thing really worked. I lost that 15 pounds. And then, you know, it lasts for just, uh, you know, a few weeks after a month, maybe two months. And then it, just rebounds and comes right back and then on to the next. Um, but this was just a common theme all the time. It was just, you know, people I would have always looking for that next diet or that next um, sort of method that was out there promoted on talk shows mm -hmm. that was going to help them lose all this weight again. Well, it's always, uh, it's always extreme. Yeah. Right. So the, the chronic dieter hops from one extreme diet yeah. to the next extreme diet. And, you know, I just recently had a conversation with somebody who was running the, the 75 hard and I was explaining to her how it promotes this kind of like, you know, on off behavior. And, and her attitude was like, well, who cares? In 75 days, I have this big event. I want to look the best I can. I'm going to get after it for these 75 days and diet. And then and then afterwards, whatever. I said, you know, the conversation that I think needs to be had that I, I don't remember. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't I didn't know this in my earlier part of my career was that you know when we when we lose body fat or we lose weight on the scale like our our fat cells are shrinking but what you don't realize is every time you put on this this the weight afterwards excessively fast like most people do right they cut 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 low 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 calorie diet 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 real hard get to the shape where they've been in then they celebrate and then they go and they eat drink and and fall off the wagon yeah. and that extreme falling off the wagon going the opposite direction actually adds fat yeah. cells so Make it every, more challenging mm -hmm. you that's right so that means every time 
you hop on one of these fad diets to get in shape, even if you think it's working for you, you're making it more difficult for yourself every single time you do it. Yeah, the theory behind that is that your body is trying to adapt to be able to capture energy more effectively and efficiently for the next round of starving. It's doing what it needs to do. And binging, right? So, so that's the theory behind it. And it does. It can make it... Look, here's a newsflash. If you lost weight and gained it all back and then some, it didn't work for you. Because a lot of people are like, no, that diet worked really great for me. It did? Why Are you where you were after that diet was done? Well, no. Well, then it, did, it failed. A yeah. successful diet, quote unquote diet, is one that stays with you forever. I remember first seeing this when uh, Atkins came out. That was the, bur the first time I ever seen a diet go crazy. Everybody was doing <clears throat> Atkins. Every, and at the time, I was a young trainer. I thought this was the coolest thing ever. And then, of course, you see that fail. And then Zone was next. Remember Zone? Zone was, oh, no, no, it's not about no carbs. It's about balanced carbs. 30, 30, 40 is a split. Mm -hmm. And then that had, then the Mediterranean came out. And then it was keto. And then the next thing. So what's the solution for this? The solution for this is to not go on an extreme diet, to not cut entire categories or macronutrients out of your diet, but rather to start very slow, step by step, and work on the behaviors that lead to successful nutrition. Mm -hmm. What are those? I don't use food to numb myself. I don't use food because I'm sad. I don't uh, use food like a drug. I develop a good relationship with food. I identify what makes me feel good and what doesn't make me feel good. And I'm open to that changing because life changes, my body changes. And so then, well, the foods that make me feel good and make me feel bad change. Develop that kind of a relationship and you'll have a more, more balanced approach to your diet for the rest of your life. Well, I love the the approach that I had with the, this client is I would flip the model or the, the idea on its head as far as what they typically would do, right? They typically would seek out the new most popular diet or whoever, and they would start on this cut where- I would actually encourage this client to add to the diet, yep. which would completely blow their mind. So because, instead of cutting things out, add healthy things. Right. Because yeah. what what I found over years of training all types of people, when I would assess somebody's eating patterns, when I said, hey, listen, uh, we're not going to follow a diet right now. I just want you to eat the way you eat and report it so I can dive into what you've been doing. Everybody, not some, not most, everybody was missing somewhere. They either weren't getting enough fiber or they were over consuming on sugar or they were under consuming on healthy fats or they were grossly under eating protein. They were always missing somewhere. So there was always an opportunity in every person, no matter what their struggle was diet wise. I always found an opportunity on, hey, you know what, instead of me telling this person to restrict like the behavior they've done for so many years, I'm actually going to look in their diet, see an area where I can see improving the food quality they're having and add to the diet. Totally different psychologically. Totally differently yeah. psychologically. And what I knew would happen is they would start to drop off some of those other things that are, aren't ideal because they're now focusing on what they need to put in Yeah, the, the diet. most common ones would be um, add protein <clears throat> to your diet, add fiber to your diet, and add water mm -hmm. to your diet. And I would, and like you, Adam, I would say, let's just hit these targets. Mm -hmm. and do those first, make those priorities, and everything else don't worry about. And then it will kind of take care uh, of itself. Yeah, before we move on to this, is, uh, and it falls in the same category of just, you know, some of those clients that are looking for that, that, supplement that one pill that thing that yeah. really moved the needle the most in terms of like weight loss because they want to stack that on top of this like really extreme kind of dieting mm -hmm. plan because like anything and everything they can do all at once because speed is really you know at the utmost importance for all of this and uh this was always a big battle in terms of like you know uh talking them out of like this magic pill idea of, of something that they're going to take to be able to produce this crazy amount of results. I do think this is a similar person. It is. Because the, the, the magic per pill person. The, is the, the magic per pill person is the magic diet person. Yep. They they are they think it was, oh, that's what it was. I wasn't doing this. Or, oh, it was I wasn't taking that. That's yep. what I need to do. And then it'll all be better. And so- you're right. Many times the, the chronic dieter is also the, the magic pill seeker too. Totally. What's up, everybody? Here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Prime Bundle, the mobility and correctional exercise programs. You can win them for free, but you got to do this. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. If you win, we'll notify you in the comments. Okay, that's what we're going to notify you. In the comments that you won free access to the Prime Bundle. Also, we got some sales going on right now. We have this bundle, the Skinny Guy Bundle, which includes all those ama amazing programs. That is 50% off. We also have the Fit Mom Bundle, which includes all these other programs. That is also 
50% off. So if you want to sign up for one of them, click on the link at the top of the description below to get the 50% off discount, either the Skinny Guy Bundle or the Fit Mom Bundle. All right, here comes the show. This next one, this one's the one that I probably have fallen to myself the most out of all the ones we're going to talk about, and that's the overtrainer, the classic overtrainer. If some is good, more is better. If I do this workout and I get this result this fast, and that means if I do twice as much, I'll get the results twice as fast. This is the intensity fanatic, the person that's seeking out the pain because they think the harder something feels, the more sore they get, the more that they sweat, well, that means it's going to be more effective. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason why this isn't true, and we've done a million and one episodes on this, so I'm not going to get too crazy with this uh, in terms of getting deep into the weeds, but the right dose of exercise gets your body to produce the best results. More than that gets you there slower because you actually overcome your body's ability to adapt and to change. What determines what's too much? Your current fitness level, uh, your lifestyle, how you feel. So this can be very different. Like what's too much for me is gonna be very different than what it may be too much for Doug or too much for somebody who's totally sedentary, right? So so the overtrainer, someone just does too much for their body and slows down the results as a, as, as a result of all of this or even stops the results uh, in their tracks. This is also one of the most difficult to communicate totally. to mm -hmm. because it, if you don't have a problem with getting to the gym and training hard and training hard consistently, uh, you've seen some results. Like they, the, your body will respond. Like you will build some muscle. You will burn some body fat. You will build some stamina. So you will have reaped some of the benefits of training this way. And so they're one of the hardest clients to convince. I mean, and I agree. I was definitely this person at one point. Like I'll never forget being the seven day a week lifter plus playing basketball, doing all this activity and thinking that like, you know, the more is better. More is better. Yeah. yeah more is better if I want to build all this muscle and get in the best shape of my life. And thinking that how could reducing the activity that I'm doing, reducing the weight training days I'm doing, could how could that potentially build more muscle? That was really hard to convince uh, convince me to do. But I remember when I did, I and I think that that's one of these things where the proof is in the pudding with this person is if you can just get them to commit to a, hey, let's just scale back a little bit and see how your body responds and wait and, wait and show them that, you're moving in the right direction and that you're not going backwards and we pull the day back. It, and I normally have to kind of wean them off, right? So yeah. it looks like that. So I got a seven day a week, double day, or like let's just a crazy intense training uh, person. And I go, okay, let's go back one day and then let's do that for a couple of weeks and then report to me, do you feel stronger? Do you feel weaker? Do you feel like you look better? Do you feel you work worse? And what inevitably happens is they feel better and or look better, right? And it's like, okay, cool. We did that from scaling one day back. What happens if we scale two, ba two days back? Do you think we'll... And, and you slowly mm -hmm. get them to commit to pulling back and then help them connect that, oh, wow, you're continually to improve. You're getting stronger. You're feeling better. And we're doing less work. Yeah. Yeah. Like reprogramming the associations with working... That's the real challenge, especially when you get somebody that like very much in this category where they know that you know, if I work really hard, I feel this way after the workout. Like I have this soreness. I feel like completely exhausted. Like I put the work in, therefore I, I'm going to reap the reward uh, because of that kind of work that I'm putting in. And to be able to, um, you know, communicate as a trainer, a coach that, uh, you know, the right dose and, and you should actually, you know, come back to, to your next workout feeling a little with a little bit more energy, with more strength, um, and recovered fully. Uh, I think that's one of the biggest components that's missing in this category of, of a, a client is just that recovery aspect, you know, being able to realize like how crucial that is for you to be able to adapt and gain all of those like attributes that you're seeking out. Yeah. One of the challenges with this is if you're working out because you hate yourself, um, then the overtraining is cathartic. Yeah. Yep. If you feel like you're, you're punishing yourself. Yeah. You're fat or you're <clears throat> ugly or you're too skinny or you're not whatever mm -hmm. you go work out and you leave the gym feeling like you almost died. There's a cathartic feeling. You're punishing yourself yep. uh, with your workouts, but that's not how your body progresses. It's also a terrible long-term approach. Nobody can overtrain forever. At some point, your body really starts to speak to you through injury or illness, or both, and now you've lost everything. Now you can't even work out at all, and all those little results that you did get through overtraining yeah. 
are uh, are totally gone. Well, so. even when they do get the, they may get some results, but like think of the potential results they could have got if they were to to add in the recovery and all these other aspects of it, and how much quicker they could have got there in terms of like them spinning their tires right. with this. There's hard, and then there's effective. So just because something feels hard doesn't make it effective. I could dig a hole with a spoon, and it's going to be very hard. But it's not going to be very effective. I'm not going to get very far, right? I could do in a much more effective way. Well, that's how you need to treat your workouts. How do I make this as effective as possible? So you may be asking, well, how do I know? Well, there's a couple signs. One is you should have more energy at the end of your workout than you did at the beginning of your workout, okay? A lot of people have way less energy at the end than they did in the beginning. You should leave your workout feeling energized, like you have just so much vitality and feeling amazing. The second sign is you really shouldn't feel soreness, or if you do a little bit of soreness the day after. Lots of soreness or the kind of soreness that hurt is, you know, feels sore to the touch or that lasts for a day or two days, that means you probably went too hard. So that can look a lot of different ways depending on the individual. For some people, that may be a very mild looking workout. For other people, it's much harder. Your fitness level and your lifestyle determines what overtraining Well, is. you said something else I think is important to point out that also makes this deceiving um, for someone trying to figure out, am I this character? Because- Sometimes that feeling you get afterwards uh, because of the, the cortisol spike is this like energetic feel and it's a little, it's a false signal sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Like, and we used to, we, in this category, like, so the, the next three categories, this, this conversation, I think it can fall into any of these people that we used to call like the cortisol junkies that just want that rush of energy. And sometimes beating yourself up will initially give you that kind of rush feeling of you feel accomplished and, oh, my God, I feel so good I got that done. And so sometimes that can be a little deceiving on, like, how how good you feel yeah. after you. After well, there's you difference. Work. There's, like, there's like nervous, sympathetic, uh, you know, CNS energy where you're kind of, like, you're, you're, you're kind of hyper, Very tense, a little and, scattered. Yeah. You couldn't go to sleep if you wanted to. Whereas the good type of energy I'm talking about is you feel good, energized, and calm. Mm -hmm. You feel calm and energized. Like, wow, I feel really good. That's different than the stimmed out cortisol, you know, surging right. through my veins. Yeah. Feeling Which like is that. hard for people to distinguish the difference right. between that because both have this kind of positive feedback loop to them, right? right? right. Like this, that's over. I just got a hard workout in. I'm sweating like crazy. I feel all amped. Yeah, I survived. Yeah, right? <laughs> and they do. Oh, man, I feel so accomplished. And so they, they get this like, oh, okay, that's how you're supposed to feel after a workout. What you're describing, this kind of almost relaxing, calming feeling that you should have when you get out of the workout, I don't, I think very few people uh, know how to target that that feeling. Yeah, well, I tell you what, you aim you aim for the cortisol afterwards. You keep pushing that hard enough, and eventually that'll be gone too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eventually you'll be like, why can't I perform like I used to? Why yeah. is this? Oh my god, I'm dragging. Well, now you you know for sure that you've definitely. Which, gone by the far. way, this same character also tends to be the character that keeps pushing the caffeine. Yep. Is because because you need more and more. You need more and more to get up for those hard workouts and to get that same feeling yep. of amped and everything like that. And so, if you're the person who started off having a cup of coffee, then you were having two, then you're having three, now you're having that plus a pre workout, then you went to the 400 milligram pre workout. Like, mm -hmm. that's normally a sign that you're falling in this category. Yep. Also, this next one is the group exerciser. So this is the individual that does it just hates working out alone. Mm -hmm only likes to do workouts if it's in a group setting with a group instructor. And they tend to, not always, but they tend to move from group exercise type to group exercise type. So now it's my power yoga. And then no, now it's my Pilates. And now it's my boot camp. aerobics. Yeah. And now it's my boot camp or my Orange Theory Fitness. This person doesn't understand how to get either self-motivated or develop that discipline. And for them, it's about seeking out, it tends to be, seeking out the next fun class that they could do. And this is characterized by the on, off the wagon type mentality where they show up to a class very consistently, then they slowly drop off and they stop for a long time and then they get back on and then repeat. The I feel like again. there's two subcategories within the group exerciser. I think there's one category that is drawn to the community and the social aspect. And that's literally the main, I mean, and I remember experiencing this firsthand coaching orange theory for two years you have the people that are there for the community like that's i come there it's a good excuse sure. to move and i get to see my girls and go have lunch afterwards and then you have the other category of people that think this is what's best for them and they're really afraid to go by themselves they're mm -hmm. afraid to do it alone because they don't know what to do they're not sure and being led by somebody in a group setting where everybody is following 
has is this comfort level of like I must be doing it right because twenty other people are doing the same thing I'm doing, and there's somebody who's leading the well, way. Sort of deflects the responsibility. Yes, right on um, on internalizing their own journey. Like they just want to kind of be a part of something that's structured and like their outsource energy, it. They outsource it. Like I have community behind me. You have all this like built in sort of um, structure, artificial accountability uh, that way. So that way you don't really have to like, you know, intrinsically deal with that yourself. Now, yeah. why is this a problem? It's a huge problem because I mean, and we talk about this nauseum on the show that there's such an individual variance with everybody. I mean, even the same body type, same sex, same age, same goal is going to have a... Well, you take two genetic twins and one of them gets worse sleep than the other or one of them has kids, one of them That's doesn't right. or their diets are different. The workouts need to be different. That's two genetic twins, let right. alone two you know genetically different people with different goals and different backgrounds. Look, there's nothing wrong with loving your fitness community. I think that's a great thing. I've worked in yeah. gyms. Community I've owned gyms. I think that's phenomenal. But what happens in this category of people is they fail to develop a personal relationship with fitness. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? When we're talking long-term success, your relationship with fitness has to be a personal one because your fitness changes and molds to the context of your life. And it's something that is with you no matter what happens, whether you travel you have access to a gym. You don't have access to a gym. That group class that you love you get is injured. Canceled. You have a kid. Yes, yeah. I used. To, I can work out every day. Uh oh, I have kids. I can only work out twice a week, or I'm stiff, or I'm. I'm or now I need to do something with more that gives me more stamina. I have lots of energy. How do I work out now? So, you have to develop this personal relationship with fitness because that's what sticks with you for the rest of your life. And if you rely entirely on group exercise, you've outsourced it, as you guys said, and that leads to long-term failure. It leads to, I'm consistent for three months and then I'm off for two months and then I get back on for a month and then I'm off again or longer. You know, oftentimes people stop for two years and you talk to people, look, I talk to people like this all the time. You know, when, when they find out what I do for a living, oh, I used to take this class and I was really consistent. I did it for two years. How long ago was that? Six years ago. Right. So why did you stop? You don't have this personal relationship with fitness. Well, it kind of reminds me too of uh, meal plans in a sense. And, and like when, when they'd ask, me as their trainer, like, what should I eat? Like, tell me exactly what I need to eat. Like just the details. Exactly. I'm like, it's just not going to work. Like you haven't, you haven't personalized this specifically to you. Like it has to follow your behaviors, yep. your patterns for this to be ever be able to stick. And uh, it, that's just one of those things. Like it, it, it it's important. Like it, once you figure that out and you find that personal relationship, that's where you become a, a part of the community. You can now give back to the community. Look, if, if you, if your classes disappeared and that means you stop working out, there's a problem. If your gym closes down and that means you stop working out, that means there's a problem. If your workout partner calls you and says, I don't want to work out anymore and you stop working out, that means there's a problem. That's I, where I, this becomes an issue. I think that's a really good point to make, Sal, because um, I know and I've, of all of us, I've probably been the the most um, aggressive with if saying I a couple of years back when I said, <laughs> I think all group classes should die. And I remember that offended so many people. Uh, but I mean, and I still stand behind that statement, but there is a point where um, does that not mean that they 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 can't exist or you can't have a healthy relationship with it? No, I think that it's just very very small percentage. But that's what it looks like to me. What yeah. you're what you're alluding to right now, which is, you know, if I have uh, this strength training routine that I do three days a week, and then I have this group class that I love to take, which is yoga or maybe it's the spin on Saturdays, and we all get together and I love it. And let's say it it stopped doesn't mean I'm gonna stop my three days a week of my right. weight training. I think you have a very good, healthy dynamic and relationship with group training. If it is the cornerstone of your routine and all you know of like getting in shape is following these classes and routines, you're in trouble. You are. Now you're at the whims of that class. And yeah. if the class goes harder than you need or easier than you need, or mm -hmm. it's canceled or whatever, you're totally screwed. All right, this next one, this is a tough, this was actually a really tough one to work with because we're not talking about somebody who's lazy or, you know, this person likes to work hard. They know what it's like to train really hard. They typically have really good athletic genetics. This is the ex athlete. This is the person who competed at a high level in high school, sometimes college, and especially ex pro athletes. I've actually had a couple in my gyms and seen this kind of firsthand. And this is tough because people equate high performance athletics with health and longevity. And I'm going to, I hate to break this to people. 
high performing athletics is not longevity and not health. It's high performance is not the same thing as longevity and health long term. It's just not. High performance is high performance. So you want to be the top basketball player, the top baseball player, top football player. There's a way you train, there's a way you sacrifice your body, and there's mm -hmm. a way that you view exercise and nutrition versus I'm now going to do this. I stopped playing in college. I'm now in my mid 30s. I have kids. I want to get in shape. I want to be healthy. But all you remember is how you trained for football or how you trained for baseball or how hard you worked or whatever. And you try to apply that now in your life and it just doesn't work. You either hurt yourself or it doesn't feel the same or you don't know the difference between appropriate and too much. And then here's a big one. You overeat a lot. Ex-athletes oh, yeah. tend to overeat a lot because when they were training at their particular sport, I mean, I used to train, I trained this uh, high level uh, polo, um, a water polo competitor. Water polo, Insane. They're in the pool for hours Insane. a day. Insane how long they tread water. Hours a day. This guy, after when he hired me, he was like 80 pounds overweight. He had the hardest time adjusting to eating like a normal person because when he was in the pool for four well, hours, eight five to 10, hours a day, calories probably. he was eating so much he had to. Now he's got a desk job or whatever kind of job yes. he's got, right? And it's, it's, yes, he's putting the work in in that hour he's meeting with you, but that doesn't even like compare it all to what kind of activity levels yes. he was at previous to that. So that has been a big uh, battle for me with, with us ex athletes is just perspective. Like, you know what your lifestyle actually looks like right now and like how we can benefit that versus like what you used to be and like what demands you used to, to face. Well, it's, it's, extra difficult too, because they had tremendous success applying totally exercise that way. Yeah. Right. Like you want to be the best polo player. You want to be the best football player. You want to be best, whatever athlete, right? There's, there's actually a lot of value in training your body to failure and pushing beyond that, those, those limits, because you, that, that is important when you are in, in playing your sport is to mm -hmm. be able to be in that situation where, oh my God, my body feels like it's going to break down and having the mental fortitude to be able to push through that. Right. That is not the best way to build muscle. That is not the best way to burn body fat. That is not the best for joint health. That is not the best for longevity at all. It's the best to be good at your sport. Right. That's what it is. And they had tremendous success lifting weights and training in the gym for that sport. And normally it's been for decades, right? They've been playing since they were junior high or high school all the way through college and maybe even the professional level if you've trained some athletes like that. And getting that person to completely rethink the way they approach the gym is so difficult. It's so hard because they connect – uh, fitness to that high performance. They connect mm -hmm. success to that high performance. Yeah. They, they, it's not just lifting. They do with that. They do work like that. They do every. That's why yep. it's so fucking hard. Is because they've now and and it has served them. Mm -hmm. They've been able to take that athlete mentality. And I know Justin could totally feel relate to this, right? You've been mm -hmm. able to take that mentality that you've applied in sports and you've applied it to many aspects of your life, and it served yeah. you it, until it doesn't. That's right. And that's the that's the issues. Like you want to be able to communicate that with a client. Like, like this, but it's so difficult to, to break through that because of that fact alone. It has brought them success in, in so many other areas, um, but it, it, it always comes to to that 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 harsh reality of like this this way that I'm applying this isn't gonna work for me. I'm gonna break. I I can even though I didn't go as high of a level as you did in sports, I can relate to having this attitude applying it to all aspects of my life. And I remember I had tremendous success in 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 the work force like this. Yeah. I had the attitude of run with me or get ran the fuck over. Yep. And I believed in myself so much that I was capable of doing anything that I would put the club on my back and I would go right the goal myself and go do all the work and had lots of success for several years that way until I got so burnt out that I'm like, I can't do this. And then I had to completely reinvent myself as a leader. And the irony of all of it was my job became so much easier yeah. in the later half of my career yeah. doing half as much and you're, work you're and getting slapping yourself like, oh, I wish I would have known this. Oh, you know? but it, it's it, it, it's such a parallel to the training yep. yeah. because it's so it's like all of a sudden you have this aha moment. OK, yeah, you could grind in the gym and get some results. And yes, you it, it may you may think it's working for you until it doesn't to your point. And then you have then you have to reinvent yourself and then you find out, oh, my God there's a better way. And when you find out, oh my God, the better way is actually half the effort, half the work, and I'm getting twice the results. You kind of have this aha face palm moment yeah. of like, what was I doing? Totally for different discipline. Yeah. Totally this, this is why you see a lot of even professional athletes, especially athletes that have to make weight classes like <laughs> boxers and wrestlers and certain Olympic athletes. When they're done with their sport, they gain a lot of weight 
They mm. become obese many times. Look at boxers. Boxers are classic for this, where they just get really obese when they stop fighting. And it's because they connect. Well, if I work out, the only way I'm going to work out is if I'm training this way. Otherwise, yeah. it's not what worth it. What is this leading towards? Yes. Right? There always has to be like a goal behind it yeah. of that's very specific. So the key for this person is to completely reinvent your relationship to exercise and pain. Do it slow. Take it slow. Take it easy. Allow yourself to slowly develop this new relationship with exercise and nutrition to where longevity is the goal. How, can I do this forever? Does this feel good right now? Not what is the max, maximum that I can withstand, but rather what is the right dose for me and do I feel good? And yes, this feels good. And can I do this forever? That's the idea with that. Yeah. The next one is the exercise hater. <laughs> this is the person that you talk to. And I usually don't run into these people in the gym. This is usually outside of the gym, obviously. And I talk to them and they say, what do you do? And I say, oh, I'm a trainer or you know, I run a gym or whatever. Oh, I hate working out. I can't stand What's it. What's the point? Yeah, why do you hate this one? It sucks. It hurts. It's boring. I used to hear that too all the time. It's boring. And it's like, okay, first off, there's a million and one. And I know on the podcast, we talk all, all the time about most effective ways to work out. But at the end of the day, as long as it's appropriate, activity is better than no activity. So that's number one. So even though I may say strength training is best and this is the best or whatever, if you just love walking or you just love cycling, and so long as it's appropriate then do that. It's be it's much better, so much better than nothing. So that's number one. Number one, find something you can enjoy and go ahead and do that and do it appropriately. And then number two is learn how to enjoy exercise by viewing it as some as, as self-care, viewing it as something I'm doing for me, not against me, or not because I'm too fat or not because I hate myself, but rather because I care about myself. I don't know if you uh, ordered these intentionally like this or not, but I feel like this connects so well to the one we just talked about is because this is the, I think the polar opposite of that person. Mm. I think this person knows somebody like that crazy ex athlete who trains hard, hammers yeah. the shit like, himself. I'm never going to do exactly. that. And they have yeah. that they're the they're, they're in the same friend circle mm -hmm. and they see the way their ex athlete friend binges, gets out of shape and then crushes himself in the gym just to lose 23 pounds and binge and they see that and they're like, I don't want anything. I'd rather be me, not killing myself yeah. like that, having a few extra pounds, I never want to go down that path because they view that that's what you have to do to get in shape. And the the communication with this person is, nah, it ain't got to be that difficult. And, you know, we've talked about this on the show many times where you use examples of getting a client to just read one page of nutrition or getting a client to just commit, come to the gym and do one exercise a day mm -hmm. or just do one, one gym day period and do a full body routine, yep. one exercise, one set, like just getting this yeah. person to enter and you, and you start so, so, easy and so basic for them that they leave going like oh man that's it that's all i had to do mm -hmm. and it's like yeah that's because we were doing nothing before and now we're moving in the right di direction we can always build on this mm -hmm. and so i think that is the strategy for somebody who is completely uh, uh allergic to wanting to yeah. get to the gym because well, it's, they well, think it's so uh, grueling oftentimes this person hates exercise because they had a bad experience in school with either sports or they didn't get picked for teams or they weren't athletic. Mm -hmm. So they just, they didn't like physical activity because of that. Maybe they got made fun of or just didn't feel natural to them or because they did try working out and it didn't work. It didn't work. They put a lot of effort. They lost very little weight or they lost the weight. They gained it back or it's very painful or they hurt themselves. They're like, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. I'm just not a, I'm not a, a, a physical person. I really hate that. So I'm just not going to do that. Well, there's so many different ways to exercise. You did it wrong before. There are right ways to do it. And it is a relationship. And like all relationships, they develop over time. So start real slow. Do what you're comfortable with. Do what you enjoy. And then let 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 it, nature take its course. What will happen is you'll slowly start to develop a better relationship and slowly find yourself doing things more consistently to the point where you start to actually enjoy it because it is self it is self care look exercise done properly improves every single aspect of your life every aspect of your life will improve if you improve your health through exercise okay that's a fact so if you do it right it's impossible to hate it unless you hate having a better life <laughs> yeah okay so if you're doing exercise and hating it you're doing something wrong so approach it kind of the way we're talking and then just give it time 
get, I used to do this. I was, I was the master at this. I was the master at taking people who hate exercise and tur t turning them into people who loved exercise. And I would do what you just said, yeah. Adam. I'd say, we'll work out once a week. Is that enough? That's plenty. Let's just do once a week. Let's start with that. Yeah, you don't have to take it all on at once. I would never push them to do more than that. I would wait for them to tell me they'd want to work out more. And they always did. They always did over time. No, mm -hmm. you, you hit it on the head. It's all about the experience that they have. And if you can give them this, this easy, good win, like right out the gates, and then another win, and then another win, yep. and they start to realize like, oh, okay, I can do this. These are the same people that are like, oh, I want to go harder. Yes. Can I add weight? Yes. Oh, this is like, you know, three months later. Like, And that's what you're looking for yeah. for someone like this is like, you keep it, you set the bar low, you help them mm -hmm. hit, hit get these small wins, and then allow them to come to you and be like, hey, I, I think I can do more. Or what if we did this? And then you know that they're opening that door for you to give them a little bit more, a little bit more. Totally. All right, this next one, this is another category that I've probably fallen into a million times, which is the forever bulker. So this is the person who <laughs> is always trying to gain, always eating in excess, always lifting too heavy. And it usually stems from some kind of an insecurity. Like they were too skinny. This was me. I was a skinny kid. I always wanted to build muscle. I was afraid of being too skinny. And so I never, ever tried to get leaner. It was always the opposite. Mm -hmm. And the problem with this is, and I, I use the scale and the weight and the barbell as success. So, oh, I gained two pounds. I'm moving in the right direction. Oh, I gained a pound on, on my bench press. You know, it's it's moving in the right direction. The problem with this is you just don't progress as well or as fast, and you miss out on so many other aspects of exercise and nutrition because you're pushing so hard, being driven by this insecurity. I'm sure there's women out there that exist in this category, but it typically is like a male thing. Yes, yeah. for the most part. Uh, and it, like to your point, like I for sure have have fallen in and out of this category quite a bit. It's just like. You know, to me, it's the the idea of dieting is like, oh, I'm going to get smaller. Oh, I'm going to get smaller and weak. And, you know, <laughs> and it just was so unappealing to me that I would rather be just, you know, a, a blob of meat than, <laughs> you know, small and tiny. So it's just all psychological. You just got to work through that. Well, a lot of times this, and you think what fed into it, because I was fall in this category also, is it when you're young and you've got this roaring metabolism, you have a very active lifestyle, you're training all the time, plus you're probably doing other things outside of that so it's super active, and you just have a hard time eating enough calories. And so it, it, it gives you that justification. I justified eating tons of ice cream and candy. Oh, yeah, and same here. A fast food. Like I was a personal trainer. Just to get calories. That's right. I was a personal trainer for at least seven years eating fast food every day still. Yeah. And and the justification for me was that I need all these calories and look at I still have abs. And so that was like my attitude and my selling point to clients. Look, if you train and you do this, then mm. you should still be able to have McDonald's and Berkey. Like literally, that was like my thought process in the earlier part of my career because I had such a hard time gaining weight. And when you have when it comes from a place of insecurity like that. <laughs> your 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 image of yourself is so distorted that even when I when I started to get fat, I didn't think I was fat. You know <laughs> I still because I was I was I was more okay with filling my shirts out mm -hmm. and being on the higher body fat, fat yep. percentage side than I ever wanted to be the seven percent skinny guy who couldn't fill out his large t shirt or whatever. So it's wild how you can get trapped in this for uh, a long period of time if you don't realize that you you fall into this category and. One of the best things ever was challenging myself to go the opposite direction when I didn't think I ever wanted that. So that would be my thing for someone like this is like, hey, I know you want to be bigger and I know you still want to be bigger than where you're at now and you're on this bulk all the time. But I'd like to challenge us to go on a, on a small cut for the next six to eight weeks and let's just see what you look like afterwards. Let's see where your strength is. Let's see how you feel. And then let's see what the bulk looks like after that. And if I could just convince that person to do that, what happened, and I'm, I know this has happened to you guys, is I lost 15 pounds and people, people told me I was weight. bigger. Yeah. yeah. And it That's was like, it was like trip. this mind blowing thing that happened to me. I'm like, yeah. I've been on this forever bulk. I go in my first cut and I get more compliments on being big than I ever did, you know, stuffing my face for the previous, you know, seven, eight years or whatever I thought. And that was because the definition came out and it looked bigger to everybody else. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, here's a good, uh, a good tip for someone like this fast. A fast really works effectively for the forever bulker. Like you do a 24 or 48 hour fast and then realize that your muscles didn't just melt and you start to kind of sever that relationship with food where you feel like you have to stuff your face every two hours and you're okay. That for me was a game changer. I did my first fast 
And I was like, oh my gosh, uh, I think I might just be eating too much. And I feel kind of good right now that I ate a little less. And then I started my first cut and I got leaner. Same thing happened. People said, you look big, Sal. What, you know, how much weight have you gained? Like, <laughs> I just lost eight pounds on the scale. Like, you know, what's, what's going on? All right, this next one. Uh, this one is probably one of the more common ones, and this is the excuse maker. So an excuse maker. Two people. Oh, oh shit. shit. Power outage in San Jose. You guys fucking running your Teslas. Uh-oh. All right, so the next one is, uh, this one's also quite common, right? It's the excuse maker. Somebody who constantly makes excuses why they can't get started, why they stopped, why they can't continue on their fitness journey. Usually this one's about being busy, right? Yeah, time. It's, it's always about time, right? Yeah. I, don't have, I don't have enough time. My schedule's too busy. Um, you know, there's a- I have there's to a, change outfits. There's a, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Justin. Good <laughs> yeah. uh, to help yourself. Yeah, I can't. Appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. um, there's a really, there, for the people who don't have enough time, there's such, there definitely is a wrong way to communicate to these people. And I think we all did this when we first yes. uh, were trainers, where you have someone in front of you, you know, let's say I'm talking to Mrs. Smith and she's got two kids and- Maybe she works part time and she's like, look, I just don't have enough time to work out. And then I used to do the whole, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. The more time you devote to health and fitness, the more time you're going to make, uh, the better your productivity. It's up to you to prioritize what's important type of deal. And usually that wasn't very successful, although sometimes it was, but it never kept people successful. It's rarely successful because it's, you're normally, so basically what you're attacking is commitment and discipline in that situation, right? By by mathematically breaking down the time in the week yeah. and basically saying you don't have enough discipline or commitment to towards your health. And it's really insulting because it's normally you, and the only time it works is when it's somebody who needs to hear the commitment and discipline conversation. It's a terrible way to tell somebody who's had a lot of success in their life being committed and disciplined in other avenues of their life, right? They have, they work 12 hours a day. They fly all over the country. They have three kids and a marriage, like, and they got all these things that they're juggling and they do have very little time and they've chosen to be very committed and disciplined in all these other aspects. And then you're basically challenging that by throwing that in their face. Especially just, if you're some young, you're trainer. belittling, yeah, their, yes. their success. Yes. And I made this mistake in my early, and I, I, I think this is, I'm glad you brought that point up because I see this a lot still today. Mm -hmm. It's a very common, especially from a young trainer, to do this whole like spiel on the uh, amount of time that you have left, and you just who you who can't find yeah. three hours a week. Anybody could find three it's hours. Very a week. condescending. Yeah, and it's just and it's not a successful approach. Yes, it really isn't. There's a, there's a, there is a better way to approach uh, this challenge. Yeah, I remember when I, this first occurred to me, and it, it occurred to me because I noticed that when people started with a small amount of exercise that if they stay consistent with a small amount, inevitably they would add more. Inevitably they notice some benefits. I feel better. This is working for me. I think I can find more time or I can walk more during the day or I could commit to another workout. And they would inevitably increase their commitment or their discipline or whatever you want to call it towards exercise. So at this point, this is when I would tell people, yeah, I, I get you being totally busy. How much time can you right now realistically commit to exercise? Mm -hmm. And then whatever answer they give me, was fine. So yeah. you got to work with. Yeah, I have 30 minutes. No problem. We'll work out 30 minutes a week. Or I have an hour. No problem. We'll work out an hour a week. In fact, I used to love hearing this from people because I knew like, that I could essentially kind of bring them in. And I knew that I would, I mean, for lack of a better term, trick them. I'd say, sure, once a, once a week is yeah. perfectly fine. And then I'd train them once a week and I'd wait. And inevitably, three months later, they would add another day or they'd mm -hmm. add more activity. And, and, and here's the real key for this, by the way. If you're listening to this and you have lots of, you have too much, you're too busy, time is an issue, you're making lots of whatever excuses. The reality is some is better than nothing. So the reality is however healthy you are and whatever quality of life you have now, <clears throat> if you added a little bit of exercise to it, even if it's 30 minutes a week of exercise to that that's appropriate. Still better than where you're at. It's still better than where you're at and you're still going to notice an improvement in the quality of your life. So there really is no wrong answer here. And, that, and that's the way too, because to, I, I know there's trainers that are listening that are going like, I, you can't get anybody results with 15 minutes a week or 30 yeah. minutes a week. Like they're never going to reach their goals. And it's like, okay, we'll we'll cross that bridge, right? Down, when we get there, when it's been weeks down the road, they've been consistently doing it and they're wondering why they haven't lost their 30 pounds sure. already or like that. Mm -hmm. But for now, like your job in leading this person is to get them moving in the right direction and at least adding that 15 to 30 minutes because you're right, it's going to improve their life. Yep. Yeah. I mean, maybe it, it 
it like translates into just making better decisions in other directions, right? Totally. It all kind of comes back. And it's just that entry point that you can build and work with. And that's like the most essential part of being able to create something that's going to actually like promote change. Uh, absolutely. A hundred percent. And again, when it comes to, if this is you, even if it's not a time issue, you have to realize that um, the biggest obstacle between you and improving your health is usually yourself, but also don't make perfect the enemy of better. And what I mean by that is, is a little bit of exercise is better than nothing, but don't compare that against perfect. You know, um, don't say to yourself, well, if it's not five days a week, then it's not worth it because it is. And maybe five days a week is never realistic for you. And I'm going to be honest with people right now, five days a week consistent exercise is unrealistic for most people. Unless you're a fitness fanatic, it's just not going to happen. But some is better than none. And that's true for all of this, and including nutrition. If you improve your nutrition a little bit, it's better than not doing anything at all. Did you just change that quote to fit your point? I, I believe I did. Yeah. yeah. So per, isn't it perfect the enemy of good? Yes. But better. <laughs> better sounds good. Better, better better sounds good too. Better is better than good. Yeah. This okay, is my Adam. quote, Sal. <laughs> uh, all right. So the next one, this one uh, we would run into all the time. These are the cardio... Kings and queens, uh, people who, when they decide to get in shape, they go and run it off. Yes. Or they go find some form of cardio where they could just sweat and burn as much as they possibly can. Obviously, not great success-wise. Uh, you don't burn uh, a significant amount of calories, really, even if you did an hour a day. It's not a huge impact. You do improve your health and fitness in, in other ways, but it's not a very effective uh, approach. And also, um, and I know you've made this point before, Adam, People who say they love doing this usually don't. They usually don't love it. No, I, I think that's the most, that's the challenge that I would have for the person that says that, right? Well, I like doing it. I love to run. It's like, okay, well, when was the last time you did it? Oh, it's been about two or three years. Like, no, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't love doing it because you only do it when you want to lose body fat or get in shape. And I think another, another part of this that makes it challenging to communicate is, uh, it's one of the, the fastest ways for people to see quick weight loss. So if you were, you know, off off the wagon, right, and you're eating whatever, drinking whatever, not exercising, and then all of a sudden you decide, hey, I'm going to get in shape, and the very the, the two first things that we do, or the average person, I should say, does when they want to get in shape is uh, cut out the bad food or the things that they know. Like most people are aware eating a pint of ice cream is not good. Drinking a case of beer is probably not good for your health or fitness. Eating fast food all the time. And so they try to make better choices there. Normally what that means is reducing the amount of intake or calories, and then they run or do the Stairmaster. And of course, if your average calories were 3,500 a day and you reduce that to 2,500 a day and you weren't doing any activity and now you do an hour of cardio every single day, you're going to see this initial drop on the scale. And so I think that's why this is so challenging is because as a trainer, when you try to communicate to this person, like this is not the best approach for success in their mind, they're thinking, well, yes, it is. This is the fastest way I've ever had success. I just lost 10 pounds. That's yeah. right. I've tried this. I've tried that. And nothing gets me to drop weight faster than cutting my calories super low, getting on the cardio equipment and running like crazy. And I lose weight, but it is a terrible long-term solution to your, your ultimate weight loss goal. Yeah. It's very much of a like X's and O's. Like this is, you know, just a numbers thing in terms of like what I'm, you know, um, what I'm consuming versus what I'm outputting. And you, you just, you end up in this sort of rat race of like, I always have to now manually burn X amount of calories because I'm consuming this when they just, a lot of times they aren't aware that you can grow, uh, you know, muscles, you can grow your body, impact it to a way where you can actually build up your metabolism to, to be a lot more resilient towards um, some of these other decisions that may not be favorable. Well, it's a losing game. It's a losing game. Cutting calories, increasing activity is a losing game to long-term health and fitness. Mm -hmm. Eventually you run out of days. Eventually you run out of how low you can cut. And then what the fuck do you do? Mm -hmm. yep. And what ends up happening is you go back. You swing, the, you swing the pendulum back the other way and you go completely off the wagon in the other direction and then it just gets harder and harder for you versus taking a slower approach, uh, uh, having a better balanced diet, building strength, building muscle, speeding your metabolism up. That just gets better and better and easier and easier for you right. for long-term health and fitness. Now, it's a slower, more gradual process, right. but it will make staying in shape forever a lot easier than it will be going the yeah, other much way. Much more flexibility on that path. Yeah, and we have to define what works, what, what it means when someone says it works. For you to say it works, we, define it as it works forever. Okay, not that it works for three months or a year and then again the way back. 
whatever you do to define that it works when it comes to fat loss and health has to work forever. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Otherwise, you're like every other person in America that loses weight and gains it back. You're this 88%, right? It's like 88 or 85% of people lose weight and gain it back a year later. That doesn't mean it works. It means it totally fails. And then to challenge those people who say, but I love running. I love cycling. I love swimming, which by the way, if you truly do love those things, nothing wrong with doing those things at all. Continue to do them. But to other people who say they actually love them, here's, here's one way I'll define them. People who truly love running run for the skill and the fun of running, not because they're just trying to lose weight. Right. So I've been, I've trained people who love running yeah. and they view it differently. It's a skill. I love running. I like learning how to run. It's just, I enjoy it. Whether I gain weight or lose weight, it doesn't matter. Totally different than I love this because it got me to lose 10 pounds real fast because that's a losing strategy. And in the long term, uh, it, you know, you end up like uh, every other statistic with uh, failed strategies. Who was strategies. that on the show? Was Sanjay Rayal? Rayal? Was oh, it oh. Sanjay? Uh, or is it Sanjay? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Right? I mean, a good example of somebody who runs for the, the for uh, the other- joy of running. Yeah, for the joy of running, the meditation, the spiritual aspect of it. Yep. Like, um, it would never would tell a client not to do that for those reasons. I think mm -hmm. that, that it's an incredible practice if that's it. But the truth is- um, I would say nine out of 10 times, the people that say they love running or love doing that, they don't. They What they have done is they have attached the quick results that reducing calories and running like crazy has provided their body right. to a, their, their a successful way of getting in shape. And the truth is it's not to your exact point is it's not that successful because you're always looking at it in these three month, six month, one month windows and not the rest of your life. It totally. was, if it was successful and it worked for you, you'd still be doing it. It today. would be working right now. All right. This next one is, uh, this one is quite common in the, like the body shaping, body sculpting, bodybuilding uh, space. It's, call, it's common in most fitness spaces, but very common in those spaces. And that's the uh, only looks matter crowd, right? It's really about just how I look I'll and how I look go. in the mirror. It's about my aesthetics. Now, this will get you so far. This will get you so far because how you look can reflect your diet. It can reflect your activity. However, chasing this is a losing strategy because if you constantly chase the looks, eventually you will compromise your health. And once you start to compromise your health, then the looks start to fade as well. And then you're and then you're in a really bad position where I'm always trying to get my looks to look better. I'm compromising my health with diet pills, extreme you know diets, extreme workouts, drugs, um, whatever. I'm, I'm training myself too hard or inappropriately. The health starts to suffer, the looks start to suffer, and then this really starts to spiral and out of And the goalpost keeps moving. Forward. Every You'll never time. look perfect. You'll never look perfect to, to the, where it's satisfactory. So, um, you know, the methods just keep increasing in intensity and, um, you know, your, your um, training and your nutrition um, definitely suffer as a result. I find the, the psychology of that really fascinating. You know, uh, being the one out of us who's like pushed it to that crazy extreme level of competing, right? And consistently mm -hmm. doing it. And when I look back at like old photos or books and stuff that I have of like that journey and that process, I can look at a picture right now and go like, damn, I was in hell of good shape. Yeah. But I, I could also vividly remember how critical I was totally. of, yeah. of, of what I looked like during that time, trying to get to the, to the next level. And it's like, wow, that's so fascinating because th having that duality, because I totally remember feeling insecure at that point of where my physique was at and then looking back going like god damn I was in great shape right there it's wild how that the goalpost keeps moving not to mention that <clears throat> even it, even if this is serving you at, at this point of your life eventually you will have to move out of this season you're going to get older of your life. Yeah, yeah i mean i and uh, admittedly this was a, a i mean and justin knows this that used to be the joke right that i used to say i don't care you know i all yeah. I, i'm all show all go like i don't care all i girls care girls don't ask me how much i bench that's right <laughs> girls don't ask me how much i bench never ask me my quarter mile them as as stuff i if, when i pull my shirt off no one goes you yeah. know could you bench this or yeah. squat that it's like you look good or you don't look good right so that was my attitude for a very long time and may have served me for, you know, quote unquote, staying in shape for a period of my life. But then other priorities happen, right? Now I'm in a stage in my life where staying flexible and mobile and being able to stay active with my son is far more important than, you know, how good I look in a bathing suit or whatever. So, you know, eventually, even if you think 
you know, a chasing aesthetic goals is, is serving you at that, at one point in your life or injury happens or aging happens, like the or inevitable, you, you will have to move out yeah. of that phase. A good example of this is celebrities. If you look at aging celebrities who've been worshipped. Oh yeah. Look, their, how, look how bad they hold on to their look. Oh, it's because mm -hmm. they've built their entire identity <laughs> and you, but you don't have to be a celebrity to do this. You could be the fit or shredded or, or hot girl or guy and I and you just identify with this so strongly, and then you start to get older. If you're lucky, right? That's a blessing all of us can have. Some is we can actually age and live a long life. And then you try to hold on to it. And you look at these aging celebrities once they get into their 50s, 60s, 70s. Yeah. It's like what are they doing to their bodies, their faces with the surgeries? How unhappy they must be. They can't age gracefully because they identify so too strongly with the with, with the what they see in the mirror. Arthur Brooks, who's an expert on happiness, even he there's data on this. I don't remember the exact numbers, but he kind of illustrated like this. He said, let's say on a scale of one to 10 for beauty, you're a five. And then you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, time and energy. You take hormones, you work out, you really push yourself and you go from a five to a nine. He says, your happiness will go up about 5% or less, right? So you spend all that time, energy, whatever, and your happiness barely goes up, if at all, versus maybe working on the relationships with people around you or exercising and eating right to improve the quality of your life, right. which will improve your happiness much more. Right. I, and I think that because I, I this all these categories for the most part, like they're they have value at moments of time in your life. I think the 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 problem is m many people identify with this this avatar or this character and then they get stuck. It's when it gets dysfunctional. Yeah. And that's where it gets dysfunctional. That's where it gets dangerous. That's where you don't have success with it long term. And so mm -hmm. You know, I don't. I don't want to demonize somebody who goes like, "Hey, I have a, a, an aesthetic goal. I want to get in shape at this period." Like, there's nothing wrong with setting a goal like that, mm -hmm. going after it, and then obtaining it. Where it's dangerous is when when you identify as that, and that is how and that's all you. And, and that's the only way yeah. that you measure your health and fitness is it, how fit you look. Yeah. And that's I think a terrible way and a, a terrible place to be. And so you want to eventually move out of that. And which I think it's such a great exercise. Um, this is something I had to implement into my life because I identified so much as this character of like, you know, letting that go and being like, oh, I'm going to be the mobility guy or, oh, I'm going to be the super strong guy now. Like, and, and totally immersing myself with that way of training to let go of that. I, it, it takes a lot of willpower and mental strength to be able to move from that if you've identified as that for a long totally. time. Totally. Now for this particular person where only looks matter, a good uh, remedy to this is to aim for performance. Yeah. So if you take someone that's really just strength. focused on aesthetics, focus on strength or speed or mobility or technique or form, it's a good segue. It's a, it's a nice little detour off of looks into performance and performance. Although you can get, you can become too fanatical with this as well. Performance is a bit of a better reflection on health than just looks. So it's a nice little turn. And I found a lot of success with this with the people who are just too focused. And on the aesthetic. byproduct is you look better as well. Too. Yes. So it's it's just nice psychologically to step out of that. Yeah. I go performance and then health, but it's always performance in between because go from looks to health right. is a really hard jump for people. All right. This last one, this one's one I have struggled with since day one and I continue to struggle with. I wouldn't consider myself a mobility avoider. But I definitely am a mo I'm I'm a little mobility averse, and <laughs> so this this is a challenge. And, and now the mobility av avoider is somebody that just completely avoids the benefits and value of mobility, and they tend to work out in the gym with more weight than they can handle. Their range of motion tends to get a little short. Uh, they tend to lift with their ego, and they tend to be really tight. So they're strong. They tend to be stronger, but they tend to be tight. All my old high school friends. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and, sums and it up. This is a problem because if you avoid mobility long enough, all that strength and whatever you think you have is going to be gone. You won't even you won't be able to do anything because you can't move properly. Also, on a functional level, real strength includes mobility. It's not just yeah. how much you can lift from point A to point B in an exercise, but rather how 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 much you can lift and move in many different planes uh, of motion. This is kind of one of those funny things because it's uh, it does speak back to like. I used to be this character on some level um, and very performance focused solely. And uh, the irony of that is performance was directly affected by uh, the range of motion, mobility and, and stability and support I had around yeah. my joints and didn't, really figure that out until after college and, uh, you know, working on certain issues and problems I had to work on because of injury and everything else. Um, but, uh, became a big evangelist for this and really, you know, to, uh, the community of sort of, 
uh, bros and, and athletes and people that uh, were very averse to any kind of mobility moves because it looks dorky or it's uh, just something that's not real appealing in terms of like, I just want to train and get after it. And like, mm -hmm. I have all this energy I want to put into the workout. I want to spend my time on this like fancy stuff. But uh, the irony of that is that how much it really improved my overall performance and athleticism and uh, just uh, avoidance of pain. And, and so it brought a lot more longevity to what I was doing uh, with my fitness. The unfortunate part about this one is that there's a, there's a pretty big movement in the strength community that is, that is uh, pinned the mobility space as uh, pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. Um, yeah. And, and so there's a, there's a, a large population of young, young health and fitness people coming up that are following some of these really smart uh, power lifters and strength community uh, that have convinced them that, you know, the whole mobility movement is this whole pseudoscience Gumby bullshit don't need to do it type of thing and you know my you know my response to that that space or those people uh that think this way will be time will tell mm -hmm. eventually this is one of those things that maybe at the season of, of life that you're in right now you can get away with lifting super heavy all the time and that's and, and you feel great and that you don't have any issues and no problems but sooner or later um you know father time always wins and that'll creep up on you and then it you eventually you will you will be you will either choose to go this direction or you will be submitted to go to this direction Maybe and so forced. yeah and so yeah. I, I think i saw enough uh enough signs for myself personally to choose to go in that direction versus waiting until I was forced to go in that direction. And I think that that's kind of the, you have two paths in this direction. Like you really do. I really think that either one, you become somebody who adopts this and, and, and builds it into your routine or you deny it for as long as you can. And then you're forced in that direction. And I just think it's a much better relationship to have it, to accept it and to learn to integrate it now, because it'll only be a longer, more arduous process for you to deny it and then try yeah. and move back in it. Yeah, the, the response that I, I mean, that is to me is just a purely revolves around ego. Yeah. And, and it's very glaring in terms of like the, um, the pushback it's, it's got received from the strength community. Like there's always, I mean, you saw this too, with just working your, your core and your abdominals, like, and, and when, uh, that movement was huge and there was this big response from powerlifting community, strength community on how stupid that is. And, you know, and it, again, like it, to me, it just, it just screams, um, you know, being stuck in, in a modality and a method and, and trying to justify your means and, and avoid anything that uh, you think is stupid. Yeah, yeah. My, my challenge is try it. Like you have nothing to lose. Try it for a month and then see if you don't improve on all your lifts. The, the irony is the data shows quite clearly that better ranges of motion, longer ranges of motion with control, build more muscle. That uh, better mobility, and we define mobility as range of motion with total control, right? Improves and increases your strength and performance. So you really have nothing to lose, and the data shows it uh, quite clearly. This is how I convince myself. Like I, I personally don't enjoy mobility nearly as much as I enjoy lifting weights, nearly as much as I like lifting heavy. However, when I do it, my lifts improve, I feel better, and my body seems to reflect that I have better mobility just in terms of the way it looks. And so this is why I go back to it. This is why I, I, I try to inject it into my routine. So for the person who really avoids mobility, try this. Just try doing this. Just try 10 to 15 minutes of mobility work before your workout. That's all. Just add another 10 minutes right before. It's a real small dose and see if you don't notice an improvement on just that little dose. And I think that alone will convince you either to maintain the 10 minutes or to make a more concentrated effort on improving uh, your mobility. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have all kinds of guides that can help you with any of your health or fitness goals. You can also find all of us on social media. Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press and they're always aiming for five reps, if you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injury.